All right, Laura, we're back for another episode of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Again, we're looking at two chapters, plural. What are we looking at this time? This time we are looking at chapter 11 on justification and chapter 12 on adoption. Adoption, the shortest chapter in the Westminster. It is quite short. I I don't know if it's the shortest, but it is short. I I believe you that you know that. Hey, before I read this... um, if you're just listening, you have no idea. If you're watching, don't you think it's so funny that for four episodes in a row, Josh and I just keep showing up in the same outfits? That's so funny. Ha. Ha. <laughs> We're trying something new, people. It is a marathon podcast recording day. It is. For Josh and Laura. Yep. All right. All right. Let's jump into justification. Chapter 11, section one. Those whom God effectually calls, he also freely justifies. He does not pour righteousness into them, but pardons their sins and looks on them and accepts them as if they were righteous, not because of anything worked in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone. He does not consider their faith itself the act of believing as their righteousness or any other obedient response to the gospel on their part. Rather, he imputes to them the obedience and judicial satisfaction earned by Christ. For their part, they receive and rest on Christ in his righteousness by faith. And this faith is not their own, but is itself a gift of God. So I want to start with a a quote from R.C. Sproul's book, The Truths We Confess. Um, He opens his chapter on this section of the Westminster with these words. The doctrine of justification is the most controversial issue in the history of Christendom. The Reformation, um, Martin Luther, the Reformation was ultimately about the doctrine of justification. How is a person made right with God? Um, As you heard in this first section, it's not based on our obedience. It's not based on our works. It's not based on anything we have done. Our justification comes from what Christ has done on our behalf and that um, his obedience is imputed to us. That's not a word that we often use, but just as we were in Adam when he sinned against um, God's commandment, Thus, we are imputed with his guilt and his rebellion, even though we weren't there. Um, In Christ, we are justified with his righteousness, even though we weren't there living the perfect life, dying on the cross. We get the consequences of what Adam did imputed to us, and we get the rewards uh, and the victory of what Christ did imputed to us. And so it is not earned, it is given, um, but it's also not, um, it's not righteousness when it says poured out on us. That's meaning that if God looked at me without seeing me in Christ, he would not see righteousness. That it is not a righteousness that I get to walk away with and it not being because of Christ, that that's what united being united to Christ is about, that in no moment of my life does God look at me and say, man, Josh is really awesome. Hmm. He says, wow, Josh is in Christ and Christ is really awesome. And so um, that so all that I do in response in to living again, to what Christ has done for me, and now I'm in him. And so God sees Christ's righteousness when he looks at me. Why would I want to stain that? When we go back to, again, to desires and what we feed ourselves and what we've talked about on previous episodes, that becomes the motivation that um, God's not looking at you or look at, I'll just keep me. He's not looking at me and seeing me without Christ. So he doesn't see all of my junk. He keeps... The filter that God has because of my faith in Christ, which is a gift from God, is he sees all that Christ did for me. 
Does he know all of the many times that I've screwed up? Yes. But scripture says, as far as the East is from the West. Mm -hmm. And so what freedom of, from guilt, what freedom from shame, what freedom from all of these things that, again, this is where theology becomes so beneficial to everyday living. This is like theology for mental health. Yeah. That the way that we so often see ourselves, we need to put on God's glasses as he views us mm. and what it means that we are united to Christ and in Christ. There's a lot of hope in justification. Mm -hmm. All right, part two. Faith, thus receiving and resting on Christ and his righteousness, is the only means of justification. In the person justified, however, it is always accompanied by all the other saving graces and is not a dead faith, but works by love. So faith, and this one is often confused for Christians, faith is not a work we do. Faith is a response of not working anymore. That's why it's called receiving and resting on Christ alone for our salvation. So faith isn't something we do. Faith is a resting. Faith is a trusting in what Christ has done for us. James does say, though, that there's no such thing as a dead faith. Faith without works is dead. And so faith that tells us that faith isn't a work because faith without works is dead. And so faith was a works. There's no point in saying that. It'd be saying like works without works is dead. So mm -hmm. faith is not works. It is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. R.C. Sproul says this on page 271. Um, again, very helpful. We are justified not by a profession of faith, but by a possession of faith. That's mm -hmm. the that's the resting. Um, faith means that resting, trusting in Christ alone. Uh, faith is also used to mean like the doctrines that we believe. This is the faith that we profess. Mm -hmm. But here, when it comes to justification, we're talking about where your trust is for your salvation. Your works or Christ's work. If your trust is that Christ has done it for me, that's called faith. But that's what it is. It's, it's, I am not trusting in what I've done. I'm mm -hmm. trusting in what he's done. That's, that's what faith is. Mm -hmm. All right. Part three. By his obedience and death, Christ completely discharged the debt of all those who are so justified. And he made the correct, real, and full satisfaction to his father's justice on their behalf. Since Christ was voluntarily given by the Father for them, and since his obedience and satisfaction were accepted in their place, and not for anything in them, their justification is the result only of his free grace, so that both the perfect justice and the rich grace of God might be glorified in the justification of sinners. So I thought in this um, little section here, I would read some quotes from Sproul just to highlight the importance of not only this paragraph on justification, but on the doctrine of justification. Sproul writes, people today hardly get exercised about the doctrine of justification, which was a matter for which our forefathers were willing to die, and many did die. This doctrine, how one is justified, many You know, brothers and sisters in the faith from centuries ago said, I give my life for this doctrine mm -hmm. and not in a, I'm staying up late and studying it, meaning like literally burned at the stake. Yeah. yeah, burned at the stake, mm -hmm. um, those kinds of things. And so just so we don't dilly dally, this, 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 this was, I mean, what are you willing to die for? Hmm. And people were willing to die for this doctrine so that people did not believe something that would ultimately not rescue them from their selves, from their mm -hmm. sin. Mm -hmm. That's how important this, this doctrine is. He, he goes on to say that Luther and the reformers asserted that a person can be justified only if he possesses perfect righteousness in the sight of God. The only perfect righteousness was achieved by Christ in his life of perfect obedience. Therefore, the only object, objective merit in God's sight is that the merit that Christ earned in and through his own obedience. It is not the righteousness of Christ working in us that justifies us. It is the righteousness of Christ that he worked in his own life, which God now counts towards us. 
God transfer righteousness from the account of Christ to the account of everyone who believes. And so what justifies us, because justification and sanctification, which we'll come to later, is often confused. God doesn't, um, your continued salvation is not based on what you're doing even today. Your salvation is always based on the work that Christ has done. Because some people will say, I've believed in Christ and now and that has saved me. But what will continue to keep me saved is me being righteous now. Mm hmm me doing the right things, me allowing Christ or the spirit of God to ha have more control over life. You could have be the, the person who has given over the most control in your life, but you are still not justified by that. You are still saved because of what Christ has done, because compared to what he did, the most best of us is still, um, I mean, you're not even on the same track. Like mm -hmm. um, we're talking perfection versus imperfection. And so to never forget, because sometimes that's where we can feel like, oh, today was a bad day. That must mean that I've lost God's love because if I earned God's love through what I do, then I can unhearn it, unhearn his love through what I do. But if you could not earn his love, if he just freely gave it to you, you also cannot unearn his love. Mm -hmm. And that's the very motivation to then want to live a more holy life mm -hmm. because he's going to love me regardless. And so why would I not want to please him who loves me in that way? Mm -hmm. And then one last uh, quote um, here. Uh, the whole point of justification by faith alone is that justification is by Christ alone, not Christ assisting us nor working in us, but Christ working for us in terms of his perfect active obedience. That gets back to why his life was important. He actively satisfied every demand of the law, and he passively received the punishment for our sin on the cross. Our justification is all through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ alone, not what we do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go on to number four. Number four. From all eternity, God decreed the justification of all the elect, and in the fullness of time, Christ died for their sins and rose again for their justification. Nevertheless, the elect are not justified until the Holy Spirit, in due time, does actually apply Christ to them. So all this is saying is that anyone who um, has been predestined to believe will be justified, but our justification is a moment in history, meaning... Um, though I believe today and I'm justified, I wasn't born justified. My justification happened when I was converted. And so justification is a historical moment in time, even though it was decided before time began. Mm -hmm. Okay. Part five, God continues to forgive the sins of those who are justified. Although they can never fall from the state of justification, they may, by their sins, come under God's fatherly displeasure and not have a sense of his presence with them until they humble themselves, confess their sins, ask for forgiveness, and renew their faith in repentance. So um, back to elders' discussion, which we go in and out of through um, this series. Mm -hmm. The elders discussed the part that said no one can ever fall from justification. Mm -hmm. And we said this, some may disagree with that. And we would not be comfortable with that person being an elder at Gateway Church. Mm -hmm. We do not believe that anyone falls from their justification. That once justified, you are always justified. Mm -hmm. And the last section in this chapter, the justification of believers under the Old Testament was in all these respects identical with the justification of believers under the New Testament. So back in a previous episode, we talked mm -hmm. about how Old Testament people were saved by faith in the Messiah who was to come, whereas now we are saved by faith in the Messiah who has come. The justification is the same for both. It's in the Messiah and what he either was going to accomplish or has accomplished, but it's by the same means through God's Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on. Chapter 12, short one. Here we go. Adopt. God Sorry. What's that? Adoption. <laughs> Adoption. Did I not say that? Sorry. 
uh, I read it and I thought that it came out out loud. Okay. God guarantees the adoption of all those who are justified in and for the sake of his only son, Jesus Christ. Those adopted enjoy the liberties and privileges of God's children, have his name put on them, receive the spirit, the spirit of adoption, have access to the throne of grace with boldness and are enabled to cry, Abba, Father. They are pitied, protected, provided for, and disciplined by him as a father. They are never cast off, however, and are sealed until the day of redemption and inherit the promises as heirs of everlasting salvation. Before we get to some final quotes from R.C. Sproul's book, um, I've said a few times on the podcast and in sermons, adoption is the reason why I would encourage us to be careful with our language. To be adopted into the family of God is to be a child of God. Sometimes we use that language, children of God, and we refer to everyone that way. Mm -hmm. And the and the theology that's getting confused is one is called the Imago Dei, that everyone is made in the image of God. That is true for Christian or non-Christian, mm -hmm. but only those who are adopted into his family who are Christians are children of God. And so Again, just careful with language. It's not something that I'm like the language police about if somebody says that, but it's important for us to remember that not everyone is a child of God. Not everyone is a child in your family. Some are children, not in your family, um, but in the family of God are the children of God. In the world are people all made in the image of God, some of which are children of God. Um, on to adoption and just some of the privileges um, of being adopted into God's family. Sproul writes, peace in this world is always fragile. It is nothing more than a guarded truce. And when the enemy rattles his sword, it can explode into another conflict of enorm enormous gratitude. And then he goes on to say about our relationship with our father, we may displease him, but once we are welcomed into his family, we are truly his sons and daughters and there is no more war. We dare not underestimate the importance of that condition of peace that has been won for us by Christ. Peace is the chief legacy of Jesus to believers. Your peace with God through Jesus Christ is not the fragile peace between warring nations that we see in this world. It is a peace that is finished because it is finished in Christ. And then he also says, um, when Christians pray out loud, they usually address God as their father. It has become so commonplace that we tend to forget what it cost for us to be able to have such a relationship with God. And what it cost was the life of his son. And so every time, every time we begin a prayer by saying, Father God or our father or my father, whatever you say. May it be a sweet reminder of the love that he has for you and his son, Jesus Christ, for it was the cost of his son's life that has given you the privilege of that peace with your father. That's a great place to end. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. We'll see everybody next time on chapters 13 and on. Bye.